The first scripture lesson comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who speak Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own language? Here ends the first lesson. We continue the story. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And even my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. The Holy Spirit makes me uncomfortable. The Holy Spirit makes me uncomfortable. There, I said it. You don't have to feel alone anymore. It's out there. And I'm not saying that's the Spirit's problem, because I know that's an us problem. And maybe you're wondering where I'm going with this questioning how I would dare make such a claim. But what if, what if, randomly, as we're gathered here, as we're singing, as we're praying, as we're trying to listen to the teachings that God has for us this Sunday, what if, during all that happens, the wind comes in through these doors, breaks our windows, What if our appearance started to change as we looked around the room? And what if we all started speaking languages that we don't know, and we were heard by those who speak those languages? I know that some of you in this this room know Pennsylvania Dutch. I only know a few words that my grandfather lovingly taught me, like slokop. No chuckles? That was a good one. Um, and I only knew, I only know a few words, but what if you heard me speaking prayers over you in Pennsylvania Dutch, not knowing the language, like your grandfather or your grandmother used to speak over you, and it reached you right where you needed to be reached at? And it was in a language that only you understood. What if healing started to take place? Not, sup- not superficial healing, but actual healing. What if everyone here, the young, the old, the men, the women, the members, and the visitors, were all part of these unexplainable events? See, we can read about the day of Pentecost all we want, and we can celebrate it, but if we begin to picture it, many of us join me in admitting that the Holy Spirit makes us uncomfortable. But why are we uncomfortable? 
Are we uncomfortable because we don't believe in that kind of thing? Either because we see those supernatural descriptions as a primitive explanation for things that were unexplainable at the time, or because we believe that God acted in that way in the Bible, but not so much in today's world. Or maybe we feel uncomfortable because we've never seen anything like that. Still, some of us may feel uncomfortable because God showing up in that way now, today, during this service at First UCC in Quakertown would completely change our view of God. And it would completely change our view of others around us and of ourselves. See, even if we believe that God can do that, that God could do that, it would change everything. And it would make us incredibly vulnerable to others and to God. So as for me, I do believe that those things happened in Acts chapter 2. And I believe that God can still move and work in those ways today. In fact, I've heard many others, people who I've trust, who I trust with my life, share with me stories of how they have witnessed the Spirit of God move in these ways. And yet, I have a hard time. I have a hard time imagining that God would move in that way around me and through me. But maybe that is a part of my problem. Notice how my uncomfortability centers around me and not God. Now, I may want to raise my hands in worship or prayer, not because I feel the need to do so via peer pressure or otherwise, but because I want to. But I don't do it usually. Why? Because I get uncomfortable. I may want to sing hymns loudly without shame, not because I think my voice is great, but because God is worthy of my praise. But I get uncomfortable. I may even want to do the sign of the cross, not because I'm Catholic, but because I find incredible meaning in praying in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and incredible meaning in invoking and making the sign of the cross that took away my sin and the sign of the cross that I am meant to pick up. But I get uncomfortable. Why are you doing that, John? You're not Catholic. What are you doing? That's silly. I get uncomfortable. So am I too comfortable? Imagine how my faith could grow if I just pushed past my own comfortability, my own fears of what others would think, my own conceptions of what is and what isn't possible, and be open, genuinely open, to the Spirit's leading. In Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit rushed in that room, it propelled them to go into the city where people from every nation were traveling to and began sharing to those who had traveled about Jesus, who they may have heard about before and they're traveling to Jerusalem for the various festivals, but maybe some of them never really got to hear about Jesus before or at least the fuller picture. So some of them were shocked and amazed that these locals knew their own native language and still others thought that these disciples were drunk. See, some were not open to the movement of the Spirit on that day, not hearing what those who were open to it heard, and they missed out on that day that we celebrate almost 2,000 years later. What do we, you and I, miss out on when we aren't looking for the movement of God? What do you and I miss out on when we keep the Spirit in a box so that we can study the Spirit instead of being open to dance with the Holy Spirit? Are we too comfortable? And then there's another risk to talk about on Pentecost Sunday. And this is when we think that the Holy Spirit is entirely separate from what, was been, what has been revealed. 
See, all throughout church history, people have said that the Spirit has done and said things that the Spirit never did or said. You, we, we've all heard of or seen preachers that promise healing that never seem to stick or to work and who call you an unbeliever if you dare doubt them, if you dare question them. We've all heard of or seen folks making bold statements claiming that God spoke to them, their church, their movement, and their denomination, and not even bothering to quote scripture in the process as if God is speaking without a reference. And we won't be able to discern everything right, but look at how Peter responds to accusations that all this in Acts 2 was just drunk people or for a big show. He quotes scripture to explain what's happening. Specifically, he quotes the prophet Joel to say that these prophecies were written, that were written, are now coming true, right before their eyes. The old, the young, the men, the women, the poor, all kinds of people were doing all kinds of odd, weird things. But it's not anything that goes against what God had already been had already revealed. It was a continuation of what was already written. It was what the written words were pointing to. When we give a different voice to the Spirit of God, instead of taking the time to know the voice already spoken, are we too comfortable? So let's get back to Scripture now. Peter's entire sermon in Acts 2, continuing past our selection for today, was about how Jesus truly was the Messiah that David wrote about, that he truly did die and rise again from the dead for our sins, to save us from our sins, and that these strange occurrences were the result of the Holy Spirit that Christ promised would come. Pentecost happened on the Jewish festival of weeks, where they traveled to Jerusalem from where they had moved to to celebrate the beginning of the wheat harvest, and especially in Judea at that time period, to celebrate the day when God's law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And here on the Pentecost Sunday that we observe in this church was the Holy Spirit coming to communicate that the new covenant has begun, and to mark a new season of the harvest of followers of Jesus Christ. And when that happened, life looked different. When that happened, what was longed for was being played out. When that happened, people saw past their limitations and saw the limitless power of God. When that happened, people were not seen in categories of usefulness, but all believers were seen as vessels for the very presence of God. When that happened, people were uncomfortable because change is always uncomfortable. But when we allow the message of the gospel to transform our lives, when we allow the Holy Spirit to push past our comfort levels and lead us in God's purpose and Christ's way, just imagine what God will do. But we'll see this all as gibberish and foolery if we keep viewing God with human eyes and if we keep viewing ourselves without his vision. Peter's conclusion in this sermon on that day of Pentecost, the day when 3,000 members were added to the way of Jesus Christ, was this in Acts chapter 2, 38 to 42. This is his final message when they said, okay, so what? What does this mean for us? He says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, every single one of you so that your sins would be forgiven, so that you too will receive the Holy Spirit, so that this inheritance of the kingdom of God that we're talking about is for you and for your children. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Wow, Peter, what a way to end a sermon. Let us pray. 
Holy God, may you move within us this morning. May our comfortabilities be shaken. Whether we are so comfortable that we can't allow ourselves to be open to your movement, or we're so comfortable that we try to seek your voice without knowing your voice. Holy God, be with us on this Pentecost Sunday. Invite us into the joy and abundant expression of that day. Invite us into the excitement of the building of the kingdom of God. And may we all join with that. In Christ's name, amen.